вперше в історії України. Главою держави стає простий вчитель із Києва – Василь Петрович Голобородько. Before he was president of Ukraine, President Zelensky played president in a hit Ukrainian TV show called Servant of the People. And that show helped propel an already famous actor and comedian into the political sphere. With his skills, Zelensky refined in his previous career as an entertainer, like commanding the stage, speaking with emotion, and engaging an audience, have been on full display as the embattled president now appeals to democracies all across the globe. U.S. lawmakers, like much of the international community, have responded to emotional, compelling pleas for help with virtually unanimous praise, a very rare sight in Washington. Literally, there was a bipartisan standing ovation. Never happens. Lawmakers have also shown bipartisan unity around helping Ukraine in other ways. Just last night, the Senate passed a resolution condemning Putin, calling for a war crimes investigation. In days before, Congress passed nearly $14 billion in aid for Ukraine. And joining me now, Illinois Democratic Congressman Rajna Krishnamurthy. He's a member of the House Intel Committee. Congressman, after Zelensky's address to Congress, you called him, quote, the face of freedom. Much of Congress was already rallying behind Ukraine. How did the address today affect that? I think it was a stirring, emotional, powerful speech. The video uh, that was embedded in his speech was equally moving. I don't think there was a dry eye in the auditorium uh, at the conclusion of that video. And I think that um, I think there's a real resolve and a unity of purpose shared by Republicans and Democrats to do more to help him. Uh, because I believe he is the face of freedom today, and his fight in some ways is is our fight for democracy, liberty, and, and the values that we all share. So this is such an important question. So just one follow-up to that point. Do you think that he made it clear uh, to the point that it got through to some of your colleagues on the other side of the aisle, um, who have a rather complicated position and line to walk in this moment, given their previous statements about Putin and Ukraine. But do you think that uh, President Zelensky set up the challenge as autocracies and authoritarian regimes versus democracies and put us all um, sort of on that democratic side fighting back? Is that how you saw it? I'm not sure that he made that juxtaposition, uh, which for instance, I and probably you and a lot of others see, but he just made it about freedom and democracy and liberty and an unprovoked, unjustified, barbaric attack by an authoritarian ruler in Putin. I think there's uniform distaste for Putin at this point. And I think that, uh, you know, I, I just felt like a gut reaction from the audience was we got to help him and his people fight this back right now. You said that we can do more to help uh, Ukraine, and you said specifically to help them mount a successful insurgency against the Russian aggression. When you consider what's included in the $800 million that President Biden just authorized, grenade launchers, 700 machine guns, anti-aircraft systems, do you think that's enough? Um, I think that we're, we're going to do more and we can do more. Um, I think that, for instance, we have to supply a bevy of uh, surface-to-air missile systems. Uh, he specifically called out one, the S-300. There are other similar Soviet-era systems that the Ukrainians are trained on that our NATO allies have, and so we should facilitate getting those into the country. I also think that he should get fighter planes. Uh, there's been uh, a lot of discussion about that. Our allies would like to provide those fighter planes. The logistics of getting them into Ukraine is another question that we have to resolve quickly. But the, the window for helping him, I believe, is shrinking because uh, as Lieutenant General Barrier testified in an open intelligence committee hearing last week, if Kyiv is uh, encircled and completely besieged, they would only have about 10 days to two weeks of food and water left. And that would be devastating. So we have to keep the corridors open into Kyiv and other major cities. And we have to protect the skies uh, by furnishing the Ukrainians with the equipment they need to do so. The video that he played at the end of his remarks was incredibly emotional for, for folks in the room, I'm certain, um, and for many of the folks at home. And I want to play you an important comment that President Biden made 
about President Putin that's related to some of the horrific images we've seen. So there is a debate about whether to label what's happening war crimes or label Putin a war criminal. The White House has been reluctant to call Vladimir Putin a war criminal for the sake of future negotiations. What do you think uh, pushed Biden to make that designation today? I think just the facts. It's so plain for anybody who is observing that Putin, first of all, this was a barbaric attack in the first instance. Uh, secondly, it's now uh, plain as day that he's no longer seeking to inflict military losses. Uh, he is also seeking to inflict civilian losses and to go after that maternity hospital where everyone knows that only women and children and babies were located and to go after this theater that was demolished today that sheltered hundreds of, hundreds of civilians it's only proof positive that he's a heinous war criminal and he, he needs to be held accountable. Right now, however, we need to help the Ukrainians repel this invasion and then prepare for whatever is to come. And that's why I've introduced the legislation that I did to think one step forward. If the Russians are able to potentially overrun the country, we still need the insurgency to succeed. And that's, uh, that's crucial. The Ukrainians need to pre prevail. I want to read you this op-ed from The Washington Post critiquing calls for President Biden to do more. The pressure on Biden to overreach is intense from the media, from Republicans, uh, and from certain foreign policy voices. This sort of thing lets Republicans get, get away with calling for more toughness without accounting for the obvious risk of too much toughness. Speak to that point. I mean, there seems to be this pro-war bias. How does that complicate things when what's at stake is not getting into World War III? I think that, um, you know, any, any attempt by folks or colleagues on the other side to say that we should enforce a no-fly zone or do something irresponsible uh, is, is, is just trying to score political points, and a lot of them know that. But a lot of them, I have to say, um, uh, are, are more sober about this. And certainly on the Intelligence Committee, I'm seeing a unity of purpose with regard to how we need to exercise oversight and share as much intelligence as possible with the Ukrainians for them to prevail. I hope that uh, cooler heads prevail on the other side uh, with regard to the discussion of our options. Uh, we need to do more, but we need to do more in a sensible way without uh, escalating into some spiral that goes out of control. Congressman Christian Morthy, thank you so much for being here tonight. Please stay safe. Thank you, thank you Selena. Hi, I'm Zerlina Maxwell. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more from Zerlina by clicking any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thanks for watching.